Hello and welcome to this short introduction to the legal framework for protecting marine cultural heritage in offshore developments. My name is Ralf Beer from Trident Archaeologie in Germany. We are a leading provider of archaeological services in offshore environments. Today I would like to show you how to get your offshore projects smoothly through this specific regulatory process. So let's visualize this whole process as a board game with the process stages being the board positions. And in the start, of course, we would like to ask what is the background of it all? And there are two points to consider. The one thing is the historic environment where the construction works may take place and the other is the regulations that come with this. And when we speak of the historic environment in marine sites, of course, these are traces from 700,000 years of human history in Europe. And what comes to mind first there are, of course, shipwrecks for most people. But also, prehistoric landscapes have to be considered due to sea level rise, as well as other smaller but not less important remains and features. So, let's have a look at this. When we look out for shipwrecks, the first point to contact in Germany is the Office for Hydrography, also known as BSH. And it has a database of all known shipwrecks, which you can see here, where every red dot stands for a ship, of course, or a wreck site. And it seems a bit odd that the distribution is so uneven. So this shows us that this map does definitely not show all the wreck sites that are down there on the seabed, but only the ones the BSH knows of. And those are mostly wrecks from about the last 200 years. But as we know that humans have been seafaring for more than 10,000 years, there are a lot more wrecks to ex be expected down there. You can also tell from sites like this, we have a lot of red dots here and a lot of red dots here. These are waterways leading to major harbors and of course a lot of works have been done here like dredging and so on. And as soon as you start working on the seabed floor, wrecks are turning up. So this is also a hint that this map just shows what we know and not what is down there. So if the construction works might take place here in the white area, this definitely does not mean that there are no wrecks to be found, it just means that they haven't been found so far, but you have to expect them. The next feature to look at would be prehistoric landscapes. Most parts of the seabed from what is now North Sea and Baltic Sea has been habitable land until a few thousand years ago due to a much lower sea level. As you can see, continental Europe extended far out beyond Great Britain and Ireland and presented very favorable conditions for hunting, fishing and gathering communities. This was especially true for river areas as it is until today. And as you can see, the river Elbe was running through the whole of the German EEZ and opening into the North Sea in an area which is now southern Norway. And of course, in the whole of this area and especially along the riverbeds, we have to look out for remains of human activity and settlements and the hunter and gathering stations. In this context, it is important to know that the conditions for the preservation of organic materials are a lot better on the seabed and especially within the sediment than they are on dry land. So in these settlements that we might expect down there, we can find a lot of things like clothing, wooden tools, ropes and so on that have long been gone on dry land. So these settlements and these archaeological sites present a very very significant contribution to our knowledge of the human past. On a smaller scale we might expect to find other remains from the human activity of the last few thousand years like fish traps, salt making sites, flood defense works, 
or from more recent times any military infrastructure, navigational features, shipbuilding sites or wharves. All these parts of the historic environment, from shipwrecks over the prehistoric landscapes to the smaller scale features, are regarded as cultural heritage and protected by law. But how is that protection codified in the statutory framework? As Germany has a federal system, we would have to look at three different levels of legislation. International, national and federal law. Let's have a look from top to bottom. At the international level, the oldest and best known regulation is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea from 1982. In its Article 303 it defines that states have the duty to protect objects of an archaeological and historical nature found at sea and shall cooperate for this purpose. A little bit more into detail goes the European Convention on the Protection of Archaeological Heritage and then also the UNESCO Convention, especially for the protection of underwater cultural heritage. But the latter one has yet to be ratified by the German government, which it promised to do within the next years. On EU level, we have a directive from 2011 with regulations for environmental impact assessments, which takes the protections of historic assets into account. And this directive has been put into national law in Germany with a Gesetz über die Umweltverträglichkeitsprüfung, which is basically the implementation of this EIA directive. Then, on German national level, we have other frameworks for the development of offshore wind energy, regional planning and maritime spatial planning, and so on. I won't go into any much detail here, but it's just worth knowing that all of these regulations take the protection of cultural heritage underwater into account when it comes to planning for offshore developments. As expected by our top to bottom approach, the most specific regulations for the protection of cultural heritage can be found in the monument protection laws of the federal states of Germany. Along the coastline of North and Baltic Sea, that would be Lower Saxony, Schleswig-Holstein, Mecklenburg-West Pomerania and, to a smaller extent, the independent cities of Bremen and Hamburg. From an offshore developer's point of view, all these monument protection laws are quite similar, especially as they all follow the polluter-pace principle. This means that everybody who wants to do any construction work or anything else like this in an area where cultural heritage is either known or to be expected, he has to make sure that the whole area is surveyed and any potential historic assets are protected and at best remain undisturbed. In this context, all three states facilitate the establishment of protection zones around historic assets. With this knowledge of the background, we can now enter the first stage of the regulatory process itself, the screening. Screening is a preliminary stage in the process really because this is where we examine the need for an environmental impact assessment. The definition says it's a preliminary procedure for certain projects where environmental impacts may be expected. Now, if we think back to our map of shipwrecks and to our map of Doggerland, with any potential Mesolithic and Neolithic sites, it's a common agreement that an impact to potential cultural heritage is always given. So this is why this stage is very, very often skipped and everybody is just conforming that the need for an environmental impact assessment is simply there. So let's move on to the next stage in the process, which is scoping. As we have just learned, in most projects this will be the actual start, rather than screening. In scoping, we are going to define the amount of work a developer has to undertake in the context of protecting cultural heritage. And for this, we need to ask three main questions. What is the extension of the study area? 
what types of possible site surveys are we going to undertake and are there any focus points for more detailed analysis. We can think of scoping as a mechanism of delimitation and for a developer this is an extremely important stage in the process because it is going to define not only what is in the scope of work he is going to undertake but also of course explicitly what's not in the scope. The legislator speaks of a process of information, discussion and determination and I think that is a very good definition because usually the stakeholders really sit together and discuss the requirement profile for each project, location and situation. Most commonly the stakeholders would be the developer of course, any consultants, the planning authorities and bodies for public interests. And the deliverable of the scoping is a scoping report for the regulator, which we can also think of as a joint formal opinion on the historic environment component of environmental impact assessment. Having defined the scope, we can now move on to the next stage in the process and start conducting the environmental impact assessment, also known as EIA. The EIA consists of four parts. The baseline, which is more or less a follow-up to the scoping report from the previous stage. Then we are going to do the surveys to find out a bit more what we can expect on the seabed. Then with that knowledge we have to assess the impacts and effects that our construction works may have to any historic environment. And then of course as a consequence any mitigation measures that might be necessary. The baseline will contain a description of the study or data collection area which should include all areas of possible disturbance or damage to a potential historic environment including anchor corridors and so on. Then it will relate to any other previous studies in the EIA, for example if we already know something about sediment and sediment transport, this will be valuable information. Let's think of our prehistoric landscape from Doggerland. So if we know that this landscape is buried under 10 or 12 meters of more recent sediment and we are going to dredge a cable canal which is only 2 meters deep, this is of course a very valuable information because we know that this landscape will not be disturbed at all. It should of course list all archaeological sites that we already know of, like the wrecks from the BSH database. And it should also examine the potential for any so far unknown archaeological sites. If we for example may have an area with a former riverbed in a prehistoric landscape and we remember that these rivers have been very inviting areas for the early settlers, then we should be aware that this area has a high potential for any so far unknown buried cultural monuments. To find out more and get a clearer picture, we will have to rely on data from geophysical and geotechnical surveys. Most of the time this data will be already available from earlier stages of investigation and it may prove sufficient or we might have to do any additional surveys with all parameters set explicitly to find any archaeological remains. All of this work will have been defined before in scoping. Common survey methods would include side scan or multi-beam sonar, seismic surveys with a sub-bottom profiler and magnetometer to find any anomalies on the seafloor which would point to any archaeological remains. Core or vibrocore sampling is used to get more information about the sediment and grab sampling will be used to get any samples from the surface of prehistoric landscapes. And the results of our surveys may look either like this imaging of a shipwreck from geophysical data or like this course with all the information about sediment and prehistoric landscapes or like this actual grab sample from the North Sea floor with some beautiful flint blades and a pig's tooth in the middle and in the top right is an arrowhead used for hunting. So we know wherever we took that grab sample from 
there will be a site of major archaeological interest. Unfortunately, things aren't always as clear as in these examples and sometimes it's just not possible to definitely classify a spot or anomaly as clearly archaeological or non-archaeological. To find out about this, you will have to get out on site and do some field inspection by divers or ROV to get a clear classification. As cost and risk is involved with this, this will only be done after a pre-selection based on all assessment factors and only after a previous correlation with the results of all other previous investigations. It is essential that all field inspections are carried out by or in the presence of a trained and experienced marine archaeologist to be of any scientific value in the further process. In areas affected by ammunition, it makes sense to integrate the archaeological field investigation into the Yuxo removal work in form of archaeological supervision. At the end of this stage, we should have a much clearer picture of the historic environment in our construction area and with this knowledge we can move on to identifying the impacts and assessing any effects our construction works may have on the historic environment. We are especially looking for any effects that could disturb, damage or destroy any historic assets and these effects fall into four categories direct, indirect, secondary and cumulative. So let's have a look what that means. Direct classifies all impacts that have an immediate effect on our historic asset. Let's assume that we have found in our survey that we have a shipwreck lying exactly at a position where we want to build a wind turbine. So if we are going to drive our foundations right through this shipwreck, of course this will have a serious effect. The same goes for actions like dredging, trenching, any excavations and so on. Indirect defines a process rather than any direct action. So we could think of score around foundations, any changes to sediment transport because of nearby foundations. So any processes of erosion and the like would be indirect effects. Secondary means that we have neither a direct action nor a process, but rather an impact that triggers another impact which finally has an effect on our historic asset. If we think of the vessels in our construction area, the vessels itself do not pose a risk, but then the anchoring by construction vessels, their wake and the turbulences by their propellers, of course, does present a risk to our historic asset and needs to be assessed. Cumulative, in the end, means that we have just a combination of impacts or uh, some smaller measures together, which each by itself would not be a big problem, but all together they could damage our historic asset. Let's think, for example, of multiple piles through a prehistoric landscape. After identifying and assessing all impacts and effects to our historic environment, of course, we would have to consider all appropriate mitigation and precautionary measures. And here, the first choice would always be prevention or avoidance, which is always the first principle for all mitigation measures related to submerged archaeological sites. For example, by creating exclusion zones around historic assets. So, for example, if we have a cable or a foundation very close to or even touching an historic asset and we are able to move that away from it so the historic asset stays safe and undisturbed, this is the best choice for me as a developer because it saves me any further costs for investigation, documentation and the salvage of ground monuments and also this is the state archaeologist's first choice because they always want to preserve any historic assets for the future as best as possible. If this should not be possible, we have to talk of reduction, which would cover a wide range of measures, ranging from active protective measures on site to watching briefs 
any documentation and relocation or finally maybe even the complete excavation and conservation of historic monuments. Please notice that the EIA as a general standard knows a third measure which is remedy. For example, if we would have to cut down a few trees where we build a house, we might be obliged to plant new trees. But in archaeology, something like that is simply not possible because archaeological sites are unique units of information and wherever they get damaged or even destroyed, there is simply no replacement and no remedy for that. So this is a measure which is not applicable in our assessing stage. We have to stick with avoidance, which is the best one, or any reduction measures. And all our proposals for mitigation measures go into the environmental report, which is the deliverable of this assessing stage. And with this, we have successfully finished the preparative stages of the process. We've done the screening, scoping and most importantly the assessment itself. And we can now finally go out offshore to our construction site and get to work. And in this stage we need to make sure that all the agreements and procedures for protecting cultural heritage from the previous stages are being followed throughout the work schedule. For this, we need to create a few documents and establish procedures, which I would like to show you in a bit more detail now. The first one is a very important document, one of two that need to be ready at the start of the construction works, and this one is the Written Scheme of Investigation, or WSI. The content of this document is basically a follow-up from the environmental report and it typically consists of a site overview, again with all the known and potential sites that may be affected by the construction works. And the site overview should also list any archaeological exclusion zones, all the anchor handling corridors and so on. It also lists an overview of all plant mitigation measures and processes related to underwater heritage and a detailed description of the methodology of these measures. And finally, also an overview of all contact persons, roles and responsibilities. We can think of the WSI as a best archaeological practice guideline or a handbook for how to deal with the historic component of the project, which will be used throughout the project work schedule. The next document that needs to be ready is the Protocol for Archaeological Discoveries, or PAD, which is basically a system of monitoring for unexpected or incidental finds relating to the historic environment. Now, we have done our surveys and assessments in the previous stages, and we think we have a pretty good picture of what we can expect in our construction area, but still, there is always the chance of making any unexpected finds and archaeological discoveries that have been unknown so far. And in this case, we wouldn't want to be forced to stop all ongoing work and wait for archaeological expertise. To avoid this situation, we need to enable people working on the project to report their discoveries and any recovered material rapidly and in a manner that is convenient and effective. Following the guideline of the PID, everybody involved in the project will know how to deal with the finds, who to report and how, and what to do next. And in most cases, there will be no need to stop any ongoing work. For this, the protocol will set out the respective responsibilities of the developers, the main contractors, and archaeological contractors and consultants. Mitigation measures again are common ground. The environmental report from the assessment stage contained proposals for mitigation measures and by now the state archaeologists will have informed us which mitigation measures we will have to execute. These fall into two groups, 
non-intrusive and intrusive measures. So the best non-intrusive measure we have learned is always avoidance. This would include a thorough planning of anchoring procedures and the implementation of any exclusion zones or as we call it archaeological exclusion zones. Any dangered wreck sites or other historic assets may be protected by covering them with more sediment or stabilize them with a layer of geotextile and sandbags. For example, this will be done to protect any open wreck sites from the score of foundations, from the wake of vessels and the turbulence of their propellers. If neither avoidance nor protection should be applicable or sufficient, then more intrusive mitigation measures may become necessary. In this situation, it is absolutely essential to have a thorough and comprehensive documentation, as we call it in situ, which means the archaeological site must be recorded on the seafloor within its context with all surrounding information. If, in contrast, any archaeological finds are salvaged and only recorded afterwards on shore or on the vessel, then all the information from the context is lost and this will only be acceptable under very exceptional circumstances. After the documentation has been completed, the archaeological finds can then be either relocated to a safe spot in the vicinity or an underwater depot. Only very rarely it is justified to make a full excavation because afterwards all finds will have to undergo a time-consuming and very costly conservation. In addition, an on-site supervision or watching brief can be a very effective system of monitoring intrusive activities by having an archaeologist on-site and then receiving immediate assessment of newly discovered finds and sites. This can be organized in any form from intermittent monitoring only in areas of high archaeological potential up to a 24-hour watching brief organized in several shifts. As I have explained before, usually all archaeological sites and finds remain on the seafloor in a well-protected area, so the only results and output from this stage is mainly paperwork. These are mostly the daily reports and protocols written by archaeologists and other people involved with this during the project, and then, of course, all the documentation that has been made from finds and sites. All these documents should be archived together in one place along with any eventual finds to be available for scientific assessment. The results should always be published at least in a scientific publication. Moreover, as the community is usually quite interested in archaeology, it is always desirable to also publish some newspaper or magazine articles or even organize an exhibition. As a side effect, this can also serve as some welcome promotion for the project owners and developers. And finally, in every project it is good practice to ensure that for all actions that have been implemented, in our case the mitigation measures, a system of monitoring has been established to check if these actions are effective or need to be adjusted. The monitoring methods are usually set out in the written scheme of investigation and should include periodic reporting on adherence to exclusion zones, anchoring procedures and the results of watching briefs. Of course, any monitoring has to be accompanied by a scheme of adaptive management to make sure that the target of protecting the cultural heritage has been achieved. For example, if we notice during the construction work that a layer of protective sediment over a wreck site is being eroded, we may need to add a further layer of geotextile and sandbags. 
Depending on the types of protective measures that have been implemented, a system of long-term monitoring may be necessary even after construction works and commissioning of a site. This is usually done through periodic inspections of archaeological sites by divers, ROV or multi-beam sonar service. And with this, we have now finished the whole process from first screening to the long-term monitoring beyond commission date. And the last but essential question is, how do we fit in? Our aim as consultants and providers of marine archaeological services is to help you to progress with your schemes on time and to budget while contributing to the protection and understanding of our shared cultural heritage. We offer a full range of services and strategic advice for all stages of the process to ensure your project runs smoothly. We have market-leading experience when it comes to geophysical assessments. Mostly we rely on the data that is already provided by the developer, but if necessary we can also conduct geophysical surveys with the optimal settings to identify archaeological finds. Maybe our most distinguishing feature is our capability in geophysical interpretation. We have the largest team worldwide of geophysical experts with the skills to identify archaeological features in geophysical datasets. This highly experienced team is able to efficiently process even the largest datasets to meet project deadlines. Of course, we also do conventional field surveys and interpretation and we maintain several dive teams. All our divers are trained and experienced archaeologists and they hold all required commercial certifications for working in offshore environments. We can also provide post-consent retained archaeologists, for example for conducting watching briefs. This stuff also maintains the required certification for working on offshore construction vessels. We have many years of experience in stakeholder engagement and we are experts in discharging archaeological planning constraints imposed by regional authorities, again, to help schemes progress on time and to budget. And then there's a full range of all other services I don't want to mention in more detail here, from ROV surveys and conservation, from a lot of digital services like building information management, 3D modeling and 3D rendering, photogrammetry, to all the paleoecology and geology services you may need in the course of a project, to finally even writing press releases and organizing exhibitions. But hold on, you might say this is all very nice, but what is my benefit? Please allow me to summarize this in just four points. First, our unique range of services that I've just been showing you. We are your one-stop service provider for every possible task throughout your project. Second, our level of expertise. With more than 300 experts from all scientific fields that are connected with archaeology, in offices throughout UK, Germany and a joint venture in the United States, we have the largest capacity to deliver marine archaeological services globally. Our large multidisciplinary team has over 15 years market-leading experience in all areas of marine offshore and nearshore development, including renewables, cables, pipelines, dredging, ports and harbors. We are proud to say that in the UK, the leading country in offshore wind, we have been delivering our services to more than 90% of all British wind farms. As one of the most experienced commercial archaeological teams globally, we are equipped to deliver even the largest and most challenging schemes. We care about our work, our employees and our customers and we have the memberships and certifications to prove it. So, the only question remaining is, what can Trident do for you? 
With our 15 years experience in enabling offshore developments, we offer support from inception to post-construction, early engagement with regulators and stakeholders to reduce risk, and clear advice to help you meet state and European standards. If you think that sounds good, and if there is anything we might be able to help you with, then I would like to invite you to get in touch. You can find us on Xing, LinkedIn, Twitter, and you can always write an email or just give me a phone call. More information can also be found on our website at trident.eu.com. I would like to say thank you for taking the time and watching this introduction. I hope I was able to provide some information you might find useful. If there are any questions left, please don't hesitate to contact me. For today, I would like to say thank you again and goodbye.